It's our great pleasure to welcome to our 2022 Online Trend Summit, founder of Future Food Movement and Veris, Kate Cawley. Today, Kate is going to join us to talk about and really make real for us the problem when it comes to food and climate, the why and the journey so far for the Future Food Movement, the emerging net zero food system, the brave businesses that are reimagining the current food system, the trends linked to climate smart foods, the importance of people and teams across the industry when it comes to shifting to net zero in food and of course much much more great pleasure to welcome you Kate to our virtual stage today thanks very much for being here thank you very much really good to be here um just a note to participants if you're joining today's summit as a trend hub subscriber you can discover more about the topics covered in this discussion in the 23 24 food drink cuisines and ingredient trends framework on trend hub so give us a bit of an intro to future food movement what is it and why did you set it up future food movement we set up at the start of this year and it's basically a new online community and upskilling platform for the whole food industry um it's found i'm a founder of various strategies and we are a, what we call a climate first agency for food and what we've we kind of identified over the last couple of years in particular is that everybody is setting these big bold uh, sustainability and net zero targets which is really important but actually the businesses that are setting them don't really understand how they're going to get there and so there is this massive skills gap um, not just at board level but all the way through to every single team right through to factory floor um, and I think that's probably the same across any industry but food is such a critical industry to get this right um, so we wanted to design a space create a place where anyone can be inspired, learn, upskill. And just our whole mantra is that every job is now a climate job. So it's an interesting one with food. And, and often we get challenged, um, particularly with some of the larger businesses we work at. They're sort of like, why is there so much scrutiny and negativity around us in the food industry? And I think it's actually, well, it's two things. One, we all have to eat. So that's why it's such an exciting sector to be in because you can touch so many people. But also it's it's not just about the rapid decarbonisation that we need to see, you know, kind of cutting carbon emissions. It's actually looking right through to how we kind of grow, produce and consume food because we're not only, you know, emitting too much carbon. We're like a big, you know, I think it's something like 25% of all global emissions come from the global food system, but we're also destroying the very natural solutions we've already got out there, i.e. nature, um, by, by the way that we're growing and producing food. So, you know, food is the primary cause of deforestation. We fundamentally need to change the way we grow, produce and consume food and actually, you know, really look at all of us individually. What are we putting on our plates and what is the impact, not just on our own health, but on the planetary health? And I think people are now starting to join the dots on that. You know, people don't like to be told what to eat and I get it. And actually, I don't whilst there is a we all have individual responsibility, you know, generally with it within how we live our lives. But also, I think it is down to businesses to kind of produce food that is better for the planet, is better for health. And actually, the kind of time poor, cash poor consumer, it's that one extra layer that they haven't really got the headspace for. And actually, if we wait for consumers, we're never going to move fast enough. And the real winners of this in this whole space are the people that are going to fundamentally transform the, the kind of products and solutions that they're providing for this 1.5 degree world. Like what is a 1.5 degree aligned diet? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, that future hasn't been set. And I think this whole people understanding net zero and putting that lens on everything, you know, new product development and, you know, their kind of category planning, like that future food isn't yet set. And I think what we're starting to see, to see emerge under this net zero food yeah. system is super exciting um but what are some of those things that you, we're starting to see kind of gains some um change? well an area i'm really passionate about is the whole regenerative agriculture piece is just amazing because we can't actually solve the climate climate crisis if we don't tackle the nature crisis no. um, it's like it's the biggest risk on all of us it's it's bigger than climate risk you know it's the if we think these extreme weather events are bad at the moment then we've seen nothing but I think on the other end of the spectrum, which I think is just as exciting, and it's not this black and white issue of being, you know, you must be vegan, you can't eat meat. I think it's really exciting, the, the plant-based movement and the meat mimics and right through to the cultivated space. I think there's space for all of it. Yeah, so obviously we're seeing a huge amount around vertical farming, indoor farming. Um, yeah. um, I'm really enjoying observing and seeing what I would call this um, growth in radical transparency. So yeah. the consumer's 
pushing this desire to understand who's making my food. Um, and I think some of the technological advances that we'll see like blockchain and AI that will start to kind of provide that transparency is super exciting. Yeah. Um, I think the whole um, personalization of diet as well, thinking yeah. to health and planet. Um, yeah. I think that's been a really interesting trend that we've seen emerge through the lived experiences of COVID actually, where you can't actually now separate the health agenda from the climate agenda. And actually, I think it's broadly recognised now that a win on health is a win on climate. Can't yeah. have healthy people without a healthy planet, and vice versa. And there are some when we think about consumers more more broadly. That I mean, just from the, the observations that you know that we're beginning to make, and I'm, I'm sure you'll have made the same some of the same ones. That there are some. And I'm going to use the, the word trends, and I I'm really talking about I guess cl clusters of shifts and movements, particularly when it comes to net zero transformation and climate smart foods. What are some of the things that you're seeing? The kind of the broader I guess more holistic shifts that you're seeing. Um, so I think one of the most interesting things we're seeing is around the narrative. And and again, what we've seen with COVID is, I mean, I've been in this space for sort of nearly 20 years, but I've seen more energy and more traction around this in the last two years than ever before, which is incredible to see. But what we've seen is the narrative is really changing from just climate change to now what we're calling climate justice. And yeah. people are starting to really engage with climate because of the people element like the social side and that global citizenship effect, which has definitely come through through COVID, right. is fascinating to see. And I think actually that's going to move the needle more on climate smart food than than anything because yeah, people people connect with people. Yeah, it's people yeah, fundamentally. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think people struggle to connect with the science. Um, you know, sci there is a communication problem. Yeah. Um, with all of us in sustainability we as an industry we don't do ourselves any favors at all um and i think yeah the whole kind of this new lens on climate change looking at kind of food justice mm -hmm. i think and that kind of climate justice which if we link it to the food industry it's actually that wicked problem that we're always challenging ourselves on is how can we not only make kind of climate smart sustainable food but how do we make sure it's accessible and affordable for everybody yeah. and that is a wicked problem I don't know how we do that with all the pain points out there and the cost of living crisis but it's you know we need to make it a much fairer transition and, and that's something we're really passionate about that the net zero transition isn't just about decarbonisation it's just not it's not just about cutting carbon it's right. making sure it's fairer and everyone has access to this better food do you think there's a, like a generational bias in this as well? And I mean, I think like me, you've got teenage kids yeah. and, and it, it feels um, like, you know, as, a, as an industry and, and I guess more broadly in all sorts of walks of life that, you know, the demands of that generation are only going to increase and they're looking oh, for massive. something different. What, yeah, what yeah I think. Yeah, we're seeing this all the time. I mean, there is nothing like a demanding teenager um, to hold you accountable. But I think, um, yeah, actually, if businesses, food businesses don't get on the front foot with this, they're at massive risk of not being able to attract the right talent. And yeah. actually, kind of Gen Z, Gen Alpha, like they are demanding this of employers. Yeah if you don't get onto this page, if you can't prove your environmental and social credentials, and if you can't show you're having a positive impact, they just won't want to work for you. So like this, we say this all the time in a session I was in this morning, this is about, you will become a magnet for talent. Yeah. Like there are so many wins in this. The biggest challenge for food businesses is the skills gap, genuinely. Yeah. I know I would say that as we, we've hopefully built a solution for it, but yeah, it's it's the skills gap and not having the talent to deliver on this because this is really hard. It is really hard. And there isn't a, we know where we've got to get to, but actually how we're going to get there, that path isn't set. Yes. So anyone on this on this page is having to be a little bit of a pathfinder. And actually, you know, most food businesses either don't have a sustainability manager or the ones that do, they have one sustainability manager and I think what isn't being recognized at a very senior level, perhaps, um, and other teams is everybody thinks that it's their responsibility. Yeah. It's yeah. person with sustainability or environmental manager in their title. It's like, well, it's their job. It's not their job. This is like the ultimate change management program. This yeah. isn't about tinkering at the edges anymore. This is about looking at what we do and how we do it as a business. And we have to fundamentally transform. 
and obviously, and I accept what you're saying and hear loud and clear about, I guess perhaps the the baseline. But are there some are there some great businesses out there that are making progress and doing some of the things that you would like to see? And if they are, who are they? And yeah, they so doing? well, it would be very remiss of me not to call out someone that we're actually working with. So Yo Valley, I think they're doing incredible stuff on Regen, and it's authentic to yeah. them as a business. Yeah. Um, they're doing some pockets are really really great stuff and it's you know it's really they are a purpose-led business yeah. but then also I tell you who I've been really impressed with that despite the headwinds um, I think Arla are doing an incredible job I think yeah. um, and what's exciting about Arla is they've got the scale yes because actually we do need to scale this we can't have it just in pockets but the other um, example I thought was really brilliant to see is um, apps and this because none of this cannot be sold without the ultimate collaboration and partnership and i think i love to see the mns partnership with wild farmed mm. so like these incredible trailblazers in the whole regenerative agriculture movement partnering with a major retailer to bring it to the masses like yeah. that's just fabulous because it's making it accessible it's mainstreaming it um you know it's a it's a really tasty product because let's not forget this all has to taste good because yeah. otherwise people will buy it um and i think yeah i'm really interested to see how it does land with consumers but that was yeah fantastic to see and i think it's that approach that we need to take in food is like all of these incredible trailblazers disruptors innovators which literally take your breath away like the best people out there um yeah. you know the ethical butcher a great example they're proving they can do it on a small scale what we need now is the for them to partner to with the bigger businesses to scale it yeah. and i think that would be a really powerful partnership yeah. so it's not just about kind of principles uh and intentions but it's also about measurable benefits as well i mean um, and there's some you know great stories that i've heard about um studies and so on that are being happened to actually demonstrate and to prove to give us a basis for communication to consumers as well um so that they can make a yeah i think there is a real thirst like you cannot over communicate on this with regards to the consumer obviously you have to have the evidence to back it yeah. up because you don't want to greenwash but actually consumers are starting to have a a real thirst for like understanding what's beneath the lid what's behind the label like who is making our food and i yeah. think the pandemic definitely amplified that um yeah. you know, there's nothing like a health pandemic to make you think about oh what am i eating yeah exactly <laughs> One of the things you know we see, and I'm certain that you will see as well. There's a bit. There can be a risk of just, um, you know, I don't know, paralysis, head in the sand from businesses that are scared um, yeah, yeah. to make big moves. You know, what are what is industry? What are consumers going to to think about? You know, if they haven't got their house in order, no one particularly, you know, now and increasingly into the future is going to want to be accused of greenwashing what's yeah. your advice to those businesses that are trying to find that balance between wanting to you know to act and to go and to make things happen but also making sure that what's going on behind the scenes is in order well I think you definitely do have to get your own house in order but also this is about progress not perfection because yeah. no one's nailing it not even no. the Unilevers of the world no one is nailing it and there's you know we have to fail fast in some of this and and be quite agile um but i think yeah data is a problem yeah. um, because actually the availability of data right through your supply chain is really hard to get this is all yeah. new um and, and, it's, I think, and it's yeah it's this bit time resource skill set to understand it how to join the dots it's complicated um but i think yeah kind of understand your impact as a business um i you know look at you know the external frameworks out there of kind of best practice that you can align to um, and then just start to communicate with with confidence and also be yeah you don't have to be an expert in this just talk with passion and people connect with passionate people that yeah. kind of new rules of influence that that yeah. we're starting to see but to be an authoritative voice in this you just have to show that you care yeah that your intention is yeah. in, the, in the right in in the right place and yeah, I mean, even with all of that, I can, I, yeah, I can absolutely see how <laughs> how businesses will be scared to take that that first move. But I think, yeah, I think you're right. Talking with 
conviction and passion and leading with intention and I, as you say it's about improvement from a from a baseline yeah, absolutely. Isn't it? and I think um being okay with saying we don't have all the answers but there's a there's a real yeah. human approach to this yeah. I think that is very authentic and mu much needed and if we don't share the gray areas then how are we all going to progress because sometimes you look at all the press releases out there and all the big announcements you would think that we're not we're nailing it there is no problem and actually, I wish people would be more honest about actually, this is hard. This is our yeah. problem. We yeah. want to do this. Can And actually, almost a, a call to action to the industry yeah. to work together on it um, yeah. because we're all operating in silos because of this competitive nature of the food industry. And that we need to break that down, I think. We touched on it a few moments ago. Um... And I think one of the biggest debates we see in, in consumer facing press, um, different campaigns that are being run, as well as in industry, is this meat versus plant argument and that one is good and one is bad. And I, I certainly feel it's more nuanced than that. Yeah. And I'd love to, from your perspective, what, what you think about that. From a global perspective, we have to eat less but better meat and dairy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we do a lot of work within the meat and dairy industry, helping them kind of transition. And they naturally feel very defensive because they're not actually doing anything wrong. But it's it's literally there's too many people to feed in this way in the world like the, the earth cannot support it so we have to transform the food system we have to look at different sources um and it's just that evolution of where we get our protein from but you know what i don't like about the vegan movement is it it's really kind of gone down the heavily processed yep. angle and kind of trying to replicate some of the more kind of highly processed junk food elements that you know are no good for health yep. um but i do think i don't like the way that they are being bashed you know, by certain commentators across the sector, that they're the devil because I think they do play a really important role because we do need to eat, you know, less meat, less dairy, but we need to make sure everything we're producing is produced in the very best way possible that supports nature and is yeah. like giving back to the earth, so to speak. I'd love to see a less divisive debate on it. As part of the natural food cycle and the carbon cycle, we do need ruminant animals. We need Absolutely. grazing animals. And um, but it's really interesting. I was with a with a client the other day who were global and you know we do tend to look at these things with quite an Anglo-Saxon lens. But actually when you look at I was talking to the team in India, they laugh at us talking about less but better meat because they're already 80% plant-based. Yes. And when you look at the 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 motivations, the, some of the root motivations between um, parts of the vegan movement, when you or whether you're talking about cellular agriculture or whether you're talking about, you know, regenerative um, farming, actually, the place that they're coming from, yeah, not, there are so many is, synergies, is not dissimilar. No, 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 no. They they all want to make a, a better food system. Yeah, I think. Yeah, no, they're definitely. Um, yeah, all coming from the same place, but just end up. It is a bit of a culture war, really, which, which is which is a shame. Yeah. Um, and I think there is space for all of it. This part of this balanced food system that we need to see. It doesn't feel like to, um, to me anyway that there's there isn't like the, there isn't the holy grail. There isn't one thing that's going to be the answer when it comes to developing a sustainable food system. It feels like it's going to be a lot of a lot of different things making. Definitely, absolutely. Food. Yeah, no. And, and also what's exciting is that that it is going to be made up of a lot of different things. Yeah. And those different things aren't set. Like there's no. so much growth and in innovation by leaning into this and yeah. helping to define what our diet will look like in 2030, which is like the milestone year to kind of hit from a from a global warming perspective. What are some of the biggest insights um, that you and the team have gathered since launching Future Food Movement? It sparks so much joy when different teams within the businesses that we're working with, because we do kind of um, open source, but also in-house upskilling programs across different critical themes and masterclasses. But when you get teams that go, oh, I get it. Like, that's amazing. Because once you know, you can't unknow. No. Like, and that that's so powerful. Most people do really want to do the right thing. Yeah. Like and and yeah, they wouldn't be coming to us or, or wanting to be a member if if they didn't kind of want to be part of this. So it's it's really good to know that climate smart food and the role that everybody individually and, and business wide can play is now definitely top of mind, I would say, for most people. Yeah. Um and I think 
there's still a real desire to do it despite the cost of living crisis yeah. but there is a lot of distracted leadership happening at the moment and there is a bit of like oh can we just park sustainability can we just park it while, while we get through this and we absolutely can't no and some of the things that i've seen um from a consumer research point of view as well would suggest exactly the same thing that the consumers are clearly having to make some tough choices, but ensuring that they're informed and, and can make those the best possible yeah. choices that they're able to is is critical so that they're they're empowered to make that positive choice. But their intention, despite cost of cost of living, is you know, no one wants to destroy the food system. No. Really. No, no, no. or the um they don't want their food choices to have a negative impact on the environment. I think they there is a they do care but it's it's knowing how to make that positive choice particularly in the times that we're in yeah absolutely and i think we we talk about this quite a lot this cost of living crisis and everything that's this in the insaneness that we've had to face into over the last couple of years with everything this is a moment in time mm. you know this is you know um yeah a moment in time where we've got to get these to the you know net zero um by 2050 that's like the cutoff date and we've seen some real ambition from the grocery and food sector most are sitting around the 2040 mark so our advice to businesses is you've got to get on the front foot because the consumer really wants it yeah. they might not be able to afford it or, or make that purchase decision at the moment because it's not a massive priority but the desire is there so i don't know you know from a future proofing perspective you need to kind of get all over this because this is coming yeah um, and there will be clear winners and losers in this i think yeah. We talked about pandemic a couple of times. Is there anything that we can learn that will help, I guess, make faster progress towards net zero? Because that, you know, that turned the world on its head. We did things that were unimaginable very, very quickly. Um, yes, and we need to, and we need brave leadership, and we need to see exactly the same leadership traits, behaviours, and attributes that, particularly, the food industry did such an amazing job of yeah. keeping everybody fed. Um, during you know during the pandemic it was a like the ultimate kind of partnership collaboration and we need to yeah absolutely apply this to the climate crisis this is a this is a whole systems approach that we need to see um yeah. and that same kind of I guess because it was an immediate threat today we yeah. need that same level of commitment and motivation towards the climate yeah, the climate crisis and I think you know particularly this year with the with the kind of weather events that we saw which were really quite frightening in, in some aspects you know that is just the tip of the iceberg and and i hope you know business leaders business leaders and businesses recognize that but i also do think we see it all the time there is a massive disconnect because these big target years seem so far away yes. and it's not they don't see it as today's problem they see yeah. it as tomorrow's problem yeah um it's and what we really it's a journey to that isn't it it's not yeah it's not we wait to get there and then try and fix it it's yeah and i think it, it you know we need to see much more open sourcing and collaboration and yeah, leaders kind of pulling together and, and actually stepping. They need to look up, not just steal from the film, but they do need to look up because this is coming hard and fast. What do you think will happen to food businesses that don't take action and embrace you know, climate smart uh, leadership and engage their workforces on climate? What, yeah, what do you think will happen? I just... I just don't think they'll be here. I don't think you can be a successful business without this. Um, I think from a very kind of um, an economic perspective, this ultimately, I'm sure, will move from being voluntary to actually ultimately they'll be taxed on it. Yeah. You, you know, we will need policy change to kind of pull the laggards up. So that will be expensive and painful. But also um, you, you people won't want to buy from you. People won't want to invest in you. Um, but also people won't want to work for you. Yeah. Yeah. Like it, there are so many risks. Like, why would someone want to come and work for a business that isn't on the doing the right thing on the right side of history? And I think, I mean, we've seen it in in my team. People want so much more from an employer now. Yeah. You know, I think the pandemic has massively affected how we approach work and how we approach life and what's important to us. Yeah. Um, and I think if food businesses don't embrace this, they will massively lose out on talent and. There is already a skills gap and a workforce shortage. I don't think people look at the food industry necessarily and say, I want to go and work there. And it's something we're really passionate about, actually, by saying, consider the food industry, because yeah. if you care about the big environmental and social issues of today, there is no greater industry you can have an impact in. Absolutely. Well, I mean, you're talking to 
two and a half thousand people right now. So what's your advice to people who in their, you know, from what they're hearing in their gut, they sense that urgency, but they can't see their employers taking action. What should, what should they do? Um, just ask the question, go back into their business and ask their leader, their CEO, their MD and say, what are we doing about this? This is really important to me. Um, and just kind of go from there. I think employees and, and colleagues underestimate their power. Yeah. Um, I think they, they're such a critical stakeholder group to businesses that actually if there is a mass movement, a mass cultural shift in, in what employees want, then the kind of leaders at the top really do have to take notice because I think sometimes the business leaders are so driven by shareholder returns and yes. you know it's an awful system that we're in and also what the customer wants that they because they're not feeling the heat from other stakeholders that actually other stakeholders need to start to put their needs and kind of desires forward I think yes. um, but there's a lot of power that employees hold not just from the impact they can drive but also the challenge that they can give their businesses to do more to do better yeah definitely if you had to kind of identify a few kind of bullets that would kind of make up that I guess what what will be on the plate in 2030 have you got any thoughts on what that would look like I definitely um it's definitely got to be plant forward right yeah. and definitely you know I think there is a really clear role for meat and dairy on that plate because I think the nutrient density and health health aspect yeah. is really important yeah. um but it does need to be that nature positive kind of like it needs to be you know, truly regeneratively reared, reared um, meat and also dairy. Um, but I think that it's really interesting when you look at our food system and, and please don't anyone quote me particularly on this, but it's something like we only eat five protein sources uh, of traditional protein sources and like 12 plant yeah. sources. Yeah. That is nuts when it's out there. Like there is an abundance of other food sources out there to explore and try. Like yeah. I don't almost think, I don't, I think when people think about being more environmentally friendly, more socially aware, it's kind of like almost like going on a miserable diet no. because you're taking stuff away. But actually, why don't we turn this on its head and be like, actually, what can we put in? What will make us healthier? What will deliver like incredible positive impact for you know everybody that's out there? And I think just that different mindset shift. I don't know what we're going to be eating, but I think it could be bloody exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And also a lot of those things are, I mean, you mentioned it earlier on, let's not forget this is about food, it's about enjoyment, it's about emotion, yeah. it's about deliciousness, uh, and, the, and the desire to kind of want to engage with foods. And many of the things that sit outside of those um, core uh, species and varieties that you just yeah. talked about are all of those things. Yeah, um, no, I think, and I, I would really, just going back to what you'd encourage people to do, is... In, start to think well what like you've just asked me what could our products look like in 2030 yeah. it's not that far away but yeah. we call it like a you know to, to be 1.5 degree aligned what, yeah. what could our category look like what and I think that future scenario planning is fascinating yeah. quite inspiring and engaging and you know it's just applying that future lens and being you know the innovation and then the MPD around it is is super exciting definitely um the killer question ours is always how are you shifting the future of food and drink but for you talking to two and a half thousand people at the summit today what's your killer question oh that is a uh my killer question would be yeah what what is your business doing on net zero like truly what is your business doing if you could take that back to yeah who you're working to to ask that question say what are we doing not just and not accepting the answer of oh we're going to get to net zero by 2040 that's not good enough no and the other thing i'd really get them to think about is are we hearing this from our ceo is this genuinely being led from the top because i think if there is a radio silence there that's something to kind of challenge and question and there may be many reasons for that but you know we we need really purposeful passionate leaders on this amazing kate a huge thank you from team tfp and the 2022 summit audience for sharing your expertise your knowledge and for helping to really make it real i think for the audience some really clear questions and calls to action there so thank you so much for that and if anyone wants to get in touch and to find out more how do they do that 
Um, so we have a website, obviously, uh, www.futurefoodmovement.com, uh, where you can sign up and yeah, just see what's going on. Um, or yeah, contact us at Veris. So yeah, we we I have an amazing team that are so passionate about food and sustainability and kind of the impact we can have. So yeah, we're yeah we're here for anyone that kind of wants help or advice. Brilliant, and obviously follow you on social. You're very active as as you as Veris. Uh, as uh, the future food movement as well so follow um i'd highly recommend following you on uh, social as well (laughs) thank you you, kate thank you for joining us today a real real pleasure to speak to you thank you thank you really good